<laughs> well, welcome everybody. Um, I see we um, our attendance keep going up. I think we show 69 people so far, plus whoever's watching on YouTube. Um, people are still joining in. So glad to see that uh, amount of participation. Um, I just got a couple of things to say, just to give an update on where the museum is. Um, we um, started a membership drive at the first of, um, around the first of December. Uh, last year, uh, in 2020, we had um, 186 members by the end of the end of the year. Um, and we're up to almost 100 now, um, which is awfully good because they dribble in through the uh, through the year. So um, if you're not a member, or if your member is your, you know, you are you are a member now, uh, renew for 2021. Just go to the website. You can see on the left hand panel there's a a square that says support the museum and that'll take you to um, a page where you can uh, where you can join or renew and also make an additional donation if uh, if you want to. Um, our agenda tonight um, is and I think we're going to do this for a while of course we'll play with it and change things as people give us ideas but at each meeting I'm going to take one, one item at the museum and uh, talk about it. Um, and uh, it won't be too long, maybe 10 minutes all together. And then following that, we've got, um, um, we, um, John Pinckney emailed me that he, he wanted some advice on, on packing and moving stuff. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to may, maybe have a topic discussion. Um, we'll, uh, after I make my, uh, my little presentation in the museum, um, Hopefully, it will, we'll keep it fairly short because I know with this many people on there, there are going to be there's going to be the um, uh, uh, interest in, in lots of people talking and giving ideas. But so I'll probably have to cut I probably have to cut it off after about 15 minutes. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. And then then the final thing is Mike Molnar is going to give us a tour of his uh, of his uh, incredible collection. So Larry, are you there? Hi, this is Larry. Larry McIntyre. Oh, wrong Larry. Yeah, I saw him. I saw he, he was connected. I'm right here. Okay. Hey, how you doing? I'm all right, oh, Steve. there's Larry. <laughs> there's Larry. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm here, folks. Okay, great. Um, what I'm going to talk about this month is... Um, Murray Mercier. Um, Murray, why don't you zoom in on that picture of him, Larry? All right. Let me take this off of here. This is going to be um, a little bit jittery for some of this, but hopefully for not not for all of it. Um, Murray, um, I thought it was 10 years ago, but Larry informed me that this stuff was here when he started working for us almost 20 years ago. So just after the museum opened, Murray Mercier Jr., um, uh, who's in this picture, called me and said, um, me and my um, uh, dad built the first television set in, in Columbus. Um, it would be helpful if everybody who is not participating, not talking right now, mute their, their, um, their screens, because otherwise, if anything, if anybody makes a motion or rattles paper or something like that, the pictures flicks to them. <laughs> um, so if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Um, then if you want to say something, if you got a question or something like that, just unmute it for that, for that period of time. Anyway, Murray contacted us and me, called me and said, I, me and my dad built the first, uh, first TV in Columbus. So he was living with his son, who's also named Murray Mercier, as was his father. So the three Murrays here we're going to talk about. But anyway, so I went over to his son's house and spent some time um, hearing his story. Um, and um, what he told me is, uh, Larry, why don't you go to the, um, to the second one, picture number two. Um, he told me that um, he and his dad built a, a television set in uh, 1928. 
and they did it in an upstairs bedroom of their house in Columbus. Um, and you can see, uh, this is that's Murray Sr. on the left, and on the right is Murray Jr. Um, and he, Murray Jr. has got a, uh, is um, in the process of uh, marking um, a piece of aluminum to use as a disc in their, uh, in their receiver. Um, anyway, uh, they, they built this in 1928. Um, and uh, once you scan over to the picture of the, of, the, of the actual disc to the left, Larry, I didn't have this on the list. Um, okay. Right there. There oh, you go. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry. No problem. Um, that is one of the discs they made. Um, I don't know how many lines that is, is probably 20, 24, I would guess. Um, but they made several because they received broadcasts from, from um, all over the country. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of discs from that, from, from this, from this receiver. Um, so now let's get over to the receiver, Larry. There we go. Um, and on the left there is a small receiver. It's got a number three on it. Perfect. Um, and uh, the, in the back is the scanner. Um, and it is, um, uh, has a, it's hard, you can't see it, but you can see a magnifying la lens in the front. And that's actually one of those little um, magnifiers that you could buy at a, at, um, a hardware store or anywhere. Um, and it had a uh, Raytheon um, neon tube in it. Now they received uh, transmissions from that I know of from New York City. I don't know if you can see anything in there or not, but uh, from New York City, um, from um, Chicago, uh, from Washington DC, the Jenkins station. And they received some of the very first broadcasts from the GE station in Schenectady. Uh, once you scan down to the telegram, Larry. Um, and so they, anyway, they wrote a letter to, to um, I don't believe you're going to be able to read it, but it doesn't matter, um, to um, um, the station in Schenectady, the GE, um, and uh, saying that they had, um, uh, had, had seen the, the programming, or they sent a telegram, rather, uh, in, in early 19... Um, 1928. Don't know the date. I guess it's November of 1928. Anyway, um, and they got a letter back from GE verifying that they had uh, had in fact um, seen the station. Well, um, based on this success, Murray Senior, who was the guy who was always trying to figure out a way to to uh, make a buck, um, decided that he was going to um, going to make a bigger set and uh, try to sell it. So he, um, um, so why don't you move over to the big set, Larry. Oh yeah, but before you do that, we scan, we'll move back over to the little one for a second. In front of the scanner is the receiver they built uh, for it. And it was a TRF um, a receiver that tuned both the AM radio band and the low short wave band, the one to two megahertz band, because that's where television was broadcast at that time. Now go over to the big set. The big one has about a 36 inch disc in it, um, but it only produces a picture about two by two inches. You can see at the back of that cone shaped opening, um, uh, that's the size of the picture. Um, but anyway, um, so Murray Senior rented a store on North High Street. Why don't you go over to the pic go to the picture of the store now, Larry? Um, um, and um, put that's not the TV set; that's a radio. But he uh, he put the TV in the front window. Um, uh, a side note: um, that that uh, location is now um, the Short North Tavern, which is a bar, of course. And I went in there just out of curiosity many years ago. And believe it or not, they had a collection of old TV sets um, all up above the bar, not you know just early post-war sets. Just by, by, and the, the owner of it had no idea that this is where the first set in the Columbus was, was put on display. Um, so anyway, go back to the set now. 
Um, Murray's job, by the way, Murray was a junior in high school at this time. So Murray's job was every night he would sit in the window, he had a mirror in front of the uh, set so he could see the picture and notice the wheel on the side, on the left-hand side. Um, that adjusts the speed of the disc. Neither of these sets had synchronization. So um, Murray described it as driving. He had to turn that wheel constantly to keep the picture still. And his job was to do that for a couple of hours every evening. Um, so people walking up and down High Street, which is a major, one of the two major streets in Columbus. And, uh, uh, and could, so the people could watch TV. Um, they didn't sell any TV sets um, for, for obvious reasons. It was so primitive. Um, and um, so Murray um, uh, decided to move on to, uh, to, to, uh, to something else. Um, he uh, went into the uh, business of providing sound equipment for public events like the state fair and, and, and so forth. Um, he had, he had uh, trucks with big speakers on the top of it, and then he had portable equipment. And his business was quite, quite successful. Um, he, on our, you can go on our website, and we have a whole bunch more information about the Merciers. It's really sort of an interesting story. We were able to get this equipment um, at an auction um, of Murray Jr.'s um, house in Grove City, which is a Columbus suburb. Um, we paid almost nothing for them. You can't imagine there was a lot of bidding in Columbus for these for these items. But and then a lot of the stuff like uh, once you move up to the sign, Larry, um, that's the sign they had in their office um, when they went into the uh, sound business. Um, so anyway, that's the story of Murray, the Murray Mercier family. Um, and anybody have any questions? Yes, Steve, I have a question on the uh, standards. Uh, you said that they received uh, uh, signals from essentially all over the country. Uh, were, were they all the same more or less de facto standard or did they have to change the disks when they were looking at it? Or uh, how, did they, how did they synchronize? How did they know how to synchronize the, uh, the signals? They, they had to change the disk. Um, they, there, at that time, there was no standardization. Uh, later, 60 lines became sort of a de facto standard, but that wasn't until the, uh, you know, like 1930 or 31. Um, at that time, there were, there was uh, 24 line, 48, 45 line triple interlace. Um, there was even one company that was broadcasting with 18 lines. So it was all over the place. And there was also not no standard in terms of the picture format. Um, all of the US standards were um, horizontal format, that meaning the picture being wider in the horizontal dimension. Uh, the British standard that Baird developed was vertical. Uh, it was a 30 line vertical scanning standard. It wasn't used in the US, but uh, so there, there was no, no, there were no standards. Gotcha, thank you. Any other questions? Well, then let's move on to the next part of the program. Um, John Pinckney, you know, as I mentioned before, emailed me with a question. John, could you very briefly describe what uh, what you're looking for? Okay. Good evening. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, depending upon where on the planet you are. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, I have uh, two plastic cabinet monitors that were manufactured by JVC back in the 1980s. Uh, these are rather unique monitors in that they have separated chrominance and luminance to them on the inputs. They work. I want to take them to my new home. And that's the uh, reason for this uh, question tonight, gentlemen, and if there are any ladies here. I am planning to move to rural Nevada. How rural? We're talking about hours from Reno. Local television is by low power relays from the nearby 6,000 foot plus mountains. I also have a couple of oscilloscopes 
uh, that I will be taking a vector scope, a waveform monitor, but it's these uh, JVC monitors that I am most concerned with uh, taking safely the uh, 2,000 plus miles west. They have plastic cabinets as well as CRTs. I've heard too many horror stories and seen too many horror stories of other folks who have had uh, bad experiences, broken 15Gs, destroyed pre-war sets. Please, any suggestions, any uh, things that you can suggest with regards to getting these things to Nevada in 2021, hopefully, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much, Steve. That's my 37 cents worth. Are you shipping Thank them? Thank you, John. Or are you going to move them Thank by you, car? Thank you, John. Uh, okay. Say again, Chuck? Are you shipping them, or are you going to move them in your car? Uh, I plan to uh, have these shipped, hopefully, with my other household goods, uh, but also suggestions on sending the test equipment would be appreciated as well. Uh, uh, who, what uh, my... Who's... Go ahead. Uh, I've moved similar ones, but in a vehicle. And the easy way to do that is with a mil moving quilt and face of the CRT down in your vehicle, and they'll get there okay. Otherwise, God help you with UPS and, and uh, you know FedEx and stuff, because they know how to break stuff. They really do. Yeah, I, I realize that they hire the people that the airlines rejected for baggage handling. Yeah, remember there's a Samsonite commercial with some gorillas uh, yes. that were un unloading a, an airplane or something. Uh, that that's who you get. Um, now, right. now these things did get here from Japan. So if you could find, the, you know, the, they put them in a box with a bunch of styrofoam around it, and that's probably your best bet. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. and I'm aware that some folks like uh, Steve have had uh, CRT sets shipped over uh, from the UK and from the European continent, and. Uh, his brain and Dave Abramson and anyone else uh, who would like to uh, make suggestions on how to pack these things uh, would be appreciated. Don, they have a, a service now where you can get a, a pod uh, delivered. It's a, you know, a, a small container delivered to your driveway. You can pack everything in there securely yourself, cushion it to your heart's content. They come and pick it up with a you know an automated machine, put it on a on a, a truck chassis, and uh, take it to where you're going. That eliminates at least the handling. You have only the the jostling on the road, and you can you can pack everything you know pretty tightly in there to keep it from moving around. It might be the safest way. Yeah, that company's called Pods P O D S, and it is a good way to move all your furniture and everything else. It really works because at least you packed it, so you know what happened to it. So this I like is that. I moved a big collection of um, test equipment and antique televisions and antique radios and all that sort of stuff from um, my uh, apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was attending graduate school. Some of you may have remembered I would drive to Ohio from, from Massachusetts to my current home with the rest of the family in Seattle. Um, and what I did was I went with um, UPAC, and I actually um, had them drop a 50 foot, you know, moving trailer in the, uh, in the um, parking lot of the apartment complex. And I packed everything into that and then they, they moved it. Um, what I found was super useful is I went to the hardware store and I bought big, you know, four by eight sheets of insulating foam, the styrofoam foam you'd use to insulate a house. And I got that in a utility knife and I would pack all the test equipment and all the televisions and everything in between like big pieces of this foam and then strap it all in with ratchet straps. Of course, the ratchet straps pushing down on more foam. And once that was all secure, then I could put lighter stuff around it. Um, the only things that got damaged, none of the televisions or test equipment got damaged. The only things that got damaged were some very light household stuff that I put in on the very top at the end that wasn't foamed and secured. So I was really quite pleased with how that, how well that worked. That, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Can I chip in? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. I, are you getting my video? It's Mike Molnar. We are. Okay. Um, you know, Mike, I don't, I don't know what size uh, monitors he's talking about and the weight, 
I know some of the things from that vintage might be where you say that is unbelievably heavy. Um, they are but, not light. Yeah. My favorite. But, uh, although we, they are 12 inch. We ship a lot of medical equipment. And um, the best result I've often had is a box within a box. So you kind of tightly wrap it in the first box, and then that's kind of floating on softer things on the outer box. The other thing I'd chip in is that uh, the professionals are a company called Craters and Freighters, and, uh, and they take over where they just come and pick it up. And you have to kind of fight to get your input about how you, you want the box done. Otherwise, they think they're the pros and they, they do it themselves. And depending on where something's going, it's even their own trucks. Um, and as far as value and insurance, in my experience with um, UPS and FedEx, if you didn't pay them to create it uh, and pack it, your chances of getting a claim paid if you ever went that route are near impossible. And the other thing on uh, insurance claims, unless you can prove the value, not the value it is to you, but what you would actually have to pay to get it replaced or what you paid for it, your chances of being happy with an insurance claim is about zero. Blake Hinkle from Ashtabula, Ohio. I think that um, I've had really, really, really good luck with U-Ship, but it can be kind of costly. I think a really good option also might be if you are a can do it, do it yourself person, renting a van and packing it really well in a van if it's not a ton, a ton of stuff. But those are the only really things I've ever done. I've packed eight predictas in a transit connect van with foam and uh, down blankets. And uh, <clears throat> I had really good luck, didn't have anything break. But I agree that um, the gentleman that said he moved a bunch of stuff with the foam, the insulation foam is a great idea. I had mem old memory foam that I stripped and wrapped the CRTs with, and that worked really well. But you also have to have them really well securely put in. Otherwise, um, you're going to, if you bang them around at all, you're going to have chipping and you don't even want that. That's my two cents. I would, uh, I, I would suggest you consider bubble wrap. I've shipped some very heavy things in um, several inches wrapped in, in bubble wrap and had very good success with that. Are you talking about the uh, large bubble or uh, small bubble type? I personally use the uh, small bubble. Thank you. We occasionally in Texas get, get a... Um, gets a, a shipment from a guy up in Pennsylvania of old radios and things, and he fills the cabinet with uh, peanuts or whatever. Uh, you want to be real careful before you plug the thing in, because if you didn't notice that the back had been taken off of it and he'd stuffed everything inside the thing, uh, it, it's kind of a surprise. But on the other hand, it keeps stuff like the PC boards and stuff and it, it, from falling out or, or coming out of place. And then he puts it in a box within a box. And I, that is a good, if you're going to send it on, on a commercial shipper, that's certainly a good thing to do because um, that helps isolate it. I've had bad experiences with UPS, uh, not quite so bad with FedEx, but uh, I used to be in the sound reinforcement business and I sold a lot of equipment. And I sent a brand new, almost brand new Yamaha mixer back to Yamaha in California because there was something wrong with it. And... Uh, it went back in the original box that got here from Japan. And uh, after about three months, I hadn't heard from Yamaha. And I'm going, what's the deal? And uh, I called them up and, and they said, oh, is that the one that's all smashed on one end? <laughs> and I went, uh, I hope not. And I said, well, it turned out it was. And it apparently had fallen off the conveyor belt going into the belly of a 747 or something from about 40 feet up. Uh, and it was toast. And UPS refused the claim, saying it was improperly boxed. I switched to FedEx immediately. I uh, I had a citation to get dented in the uh, corner by FedEx. Uh, it looked beautiful when it, it when it was sent, and it arrived dented in the corner, and that hurts when you get an amp like that wrecked. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, none of them are perfect. I mean, they're all terrible. FedEx was better on paying claims. That's the only thing I could say. If it was in the right box, 
but uh, it, UPS absolutely refused to uh, to acknowledge that it was properly packed, even though it was in the original packing material that somehow managed to get here from Japan. Uh, along the same lines, I'm also shipping uh, several uh, VCRs, including a uh, Matsushita production machine that uh, converts from uh, PAL over to uh, never the same color. And uh, similar suggestions regarding uh, packing that monster. It's only a little bit larger than the typical old-fashioned home VCR. Uh, if I may make a couple of suggestions. First of all, uh, your receivers, uh, if you're going to ship them with your household furniture, uh, you might consider getting them uh, professionally crated, but make sure that they put handles on it. I had a couple of things crated very safely that went with my furniture cross country. And the big problem for the movers that I didn't realize would be trouble was the craters did not put handles on it and they load the truck manually. And it was very iffy whether they would drop the stuff because they had nothing to grip. And regarding your uh, tape recorders and things like that, the thing we always did at work was a double box. And uh, of course, since we were repeatedly shipping those things, we would get uh, uh, the um, uh, professional uh, crates so that the uh, equipment was, was double padded and the crates had handles and uh, casters so they could be rolled up ramp onto the truck. Uh -huh. And that generally saved it. And although we did have cases where uh, things were pierced by a fork truck or the casters were broken off by uh, not having the ramps even with the truck bed. John? You think you've gotten enough ideas? Oh, I, I've been given so much. <laughs> I've been given more uh, food for thought than what you'd find in a supermarket. And I thank <laughs> everybody for their uh, input. And uh, I think uh, I now have a good uh, foundation on how to pack this stuff. Uh, this will be the longest move I've ever made with uh, a lot of electronic equipment. And I am praying that it's going to be the last move I ever <laughs> make. <laughs> thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay, well, thank thank everybody for their comments. Um, if you have a um, um, whoops, we got somebody's shared their screen with us by mistake. Dave A. Yeah, sorry, I think that was me by accident. Okay, yeah, you could shut that off. That would be good. Um, in any way, in any case, um, anybody have um, uh, a, any topics, please email them to me or to uh, uh, Dave Sika. Um, our uh, uh, email address is info at earlytelevision.org, and it's on our website all over the place. So, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I don't know how many old guys we got left here. I'm seeing a lot fewer people. Uh, I'm 77, and I was a big fan of Captain Video. And uh, any of you guys remember that at all? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> what uh, What still haunts me about that show is the background music. Okay. By a guy, I think a composer named, uh, shortened from Rabinowitz, <laughs> Benny Robin, R O B B I N. He had an orchestra uh, and he played in South America and Italy and I suppose here, but he, 
he made the music for Captain Video, and it was so unique and so right on. And I, I remember about six to eight or ten pieces from time to time, and I just would love to find find recordings. I think I think it's impossible. None of you guys know anything about that, right? Well, I'll give you I'll tell you what I would do is there's a a fellow in the broadcast business named Fred Scott Jr. And he's the national sales manager for a uh, equipment uh, vendor, small equipment, uh, small utility devices. Um, his company was recently bought up, but he's still around. His father was the announcer on Captain Video, Fred Scott. Okay. He, he was also the house announcer for WABD for a number of years in New York. Yeah. So, um, if you want, um, I can, I can, I have his card in my office. I could find his information i can send it off to uh to steve and then he can forward it to you are you on are you on facebook uh yeah so, yeah so my jerry ryberg r-y-b-e-r-g yeah uh that's great. If, if anybody who's who's left knows it would be fred jr he would know fred scott jr yep and where's where's he at he's in I, he was in long island then he moved to california Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the company because I just bought some of his stuff for ESPN and it right out of my head. But mm. um, um, he, 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 every NAB, he was there. And what is your told, name? What's that? What is your name? John Turner. John Turner. Okay. Remember, hey, John, John what, if you find any information, send it to me and I'll, I will send it on uh, uh, to Jerry. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay, great. Thank and you. if any of you are young at heart, Get one of these, Oculus Quest Two. Oh, okay. I'm playing <laughs> Vader Immortal. I'm loving it. <laughs> okay. it is let, so let's cool. uh, okay. let let's move on to the last part of our um, program tonight. Um, and um, Steve, yeah. Sorry, may I? Sorry to may, may I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Um, I'm a first. I just wanted to thank you and your colleagues for your incredible museum and website. I'm a newbie to this aspect of the hobby, but have been fascinated with uh, certain aspects of early television. And thank you for all of the work uh, that that you have done. And I've uh, read and slowly picked up some information over the years. My my question is, is that one of my mentors, uh, who is also a very serious uh, television collector, he goes by the moniker Ampico Kid on the internet. He says he's a friend of yours. Um, he told me uh, that the CT100 was the only color television that actually got the color spec absolutely correct. And I was wondering if you could, I guess, briefly uh, elaborate on why, if that was so, and whether the, the color television that beat RCA by one week, did it have a similar? Um, you know, I think there are probably people on tonight that are better at talking about that than me. Um, I'm thinking I saw Steve Kissinger on. Um, is there anybody that would like to chime in with a brief answer here? I don't, I don't think there's... There's Wayne, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the answer is the uh, 15G, peak 22, right. and the uh, 21AX, peak 22, both had uh, legitimate NTSC phosphors. And uh, after those, uh, those two uh, CRTs, things got uh, changed uh, quite a bit. Yeah, you know, Wayne, I was thinking about IQ demodulation. Usually, I know when the when the uh, imports started coming from Japan, those were all R minus Y, B minus Y demods. Absolutely, none of them had IQ demodulation. Uh, well, that's they, they, uh, that's they a important. question of color detail, not the actual colors themselves. Um, can I interject here real quickly? I've got a CTC4 
And I know the the look of the older phosphors have that gray, that that greenish look. My two, my 21 AXP on that set looks more like a newer, um, like more like the rare earth tubes look. Um, and when did they discontinue making Wait. AXPs? Because could, could I could I interrupt for a second? Um, why don't we make this the topic for next meeting? Yeah, uh, because I think there is a lot to be said about this, um, and um, you know, because there's a lot of information that a lot of the people who are on this forum um, can can tell us about. So I would suggest that that we make this the topic for next uh, um, next meeting. Is that very sound kind. good? Thank you. Okay, um, so let's go to Mike Molnar. Mike, um, I've known for years. Uh, he'd come to um, um, many of our conventions. Um, he is a he's a great guy. He's been I've asked him for favors in the past, and he's been great. Um, and um, I know he has a, an amazing collection. So um, let's turn it over to Mike and let Mike uh, give us a little tour. Do I have to hit a share thing? Oh, you got me. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, our home. And um, and yes, I'm gonna give you a tour. I know we're doing this different because of uh, coronavirus 19, but I do need to give you a, a, a brief description of an affliction that I've had for many years. It's called collector virus 19. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> collector virus, 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 19, teen, teen. And it starts easily. It's it's very common. You go to a flea market, you go to a garage sale, you go to a yard sale, and you see something like this. And you say to yourself, that's really neat. I wish I had one of these. Lady, what is it? And she says, that was my grandfather's radio. He loved that radio. He would do anything to tell you about his radio. But but it doesn't work now and we're moving to a smaller place. Would you like to buy it? Sure, I'll take it. And you start to look around at it and you find out things about it that are really unusual. Like this, whoever saw a big blast transistor like that? So that's how it starts. And then there's more yard sales and there's more flea markets and there's more auctions. And the next thing you know, Years have gone by. There's a few pieces every year starts to add up. And pretty soon you're looking at things where you're saying to your wife, you know, this guy has this really neat thing for sale. It's, a, it's an electrotherapy machine. It's, it's over a hundred years old. And he said it could fit in two vans and we could bring it home and, and we'll make room for it. And you end up with something like this. <laughs> about the size of two refrigerators. Let me come over here and show you a few things about it. Inside here, a big glass disc. This would have been in a doctor's office in 1901. And they would hire a young boy to crank the handles. And he would get these big glass discs moving like a Windsor's machine. Only this is what was called a Holtz machine where it, kept, it could generate a steady current, as long as you can have that guy cranking on the other side. And eventually, it would build up to 100,000 volts. And for whatever the doctor wanted to do, when he got the right amount of spark going through here, then he would hook you up to the probes. And I'll take this over here and show you what some of that would look like. I don't cut this off. Let's see. Here's one of the textbooks. And you could see the doctor applying the probes to this young woman who is uh, standing on, an, on one of these uh, insulated uh, stools so that there's glass legs on it. They're down here below. And, um, and this man is getting a, uh, an examination from the other end. And in the textbooks, they even say back then that uh, you'd really want to be careful that your patients aren't telling you that they're feeling a lot better just because they don't want another examination. <laughs> some of the, the big glass plates inside. 
What was that supposed to cure? Everything. There is even uh, a lot of documentation about very early in the um, uh, in the early days of, of Morse code uh, telegraph systems that people were feeling stressed out because they used to have in their business, if they were dealing with someone in England, two weeks for a letter to go and come back. Now they had to answer things the next day and the stress was just getting to them. So they had a probe for that. If you had to get the big treatment, let me see if I can get this in. You would have to get what they call the, uh, let me switch this over. Uh, there. They would put this on you and you would get the full body treatment. I have to leave the hat on because I'm getting a lot of glare off the uh, ceiling lights. But oops, <laughs> they had uh, probes here for, for everything. Those are the last legs on the Basically, think of a diatherby machine. Um, this could actually run an x-ray tube. There's x-ray tubes up there on the top. And that would just go between all the different uh, connections to the, uh, to the brass balls here. And um, the downside was when you're running an x-ray tube just on static electricity, some of the uh, x-rays that now only take uh, milliseconds would take like 20 minutes. So um, you would have to really hold still for a long time. Didn't, well, we, soon used to, didn't we used to hear about electroshock for depression? You know, it's a few oh, yeah. decades back. That too. Uh, they had, <laughs> you know, the, the idea uh, from what I can tell from some of the textbooks, uh, from the minute they decided that electricity would make a, a, a dead frog leg twitch, that adding electricity to any living thing could only be good. You're like adding energy into them. And soon they, um, this is a 1913 x-ray system here. And that uh, starts to have a lot more of a Frankenstein laboratory kind of look to it than, um, than the other things. Let me switch this again. Uh, no, didn't do it. There you are. So this x-ray tube would be up in the room, you would be on a bed under it and the x-ray film uh, under that. And then it's, there would be um, either some kind of a motor generator hookup or um, uh, it could be uh, some of them just powered uh, even bigger static electric machines. But then you're getting into to bigger x-ray tubes and a little faster exposure. Um, if, if, if you can, this, Mike, Mike, if you can turn your, uh, turn your phone sideways so we fill up the whole screen. Okay. There we go. How's that? All right. Oops. And then um, I also wanted to show you in this room before we come back later for televisions. This is a um, <clears throat> built by Western Electric. It's a <clears throat> exact replica of Bell's uh, patent models. It was made for the 50th anniversary of the uh, telephone's invention. And it shows you everything really on the this would be the um, speaker, basically. And you could see um, a coil, a, um, a drum of material, and then the, how the uh, magnetic field from the coil would pull that uh, pressure thing off the, uh, the drum to, uh, to make it vibrate. And the microphone piece uh, area to talk into, and then uh, it vibrates a drum, which is then pushing a little magnetic rod down into this coil to uh, to generate the uh, electric current. So <clears throat> that's a neat piece I've had for many years. One of the older things in this room is this static machine came from uh, a seller in England. And uh, it's one of the very older pieces here. This dates from uh, the, the uh, 18, um, late 18, no, I'm sorry, 1780 period. It was made by, um, G. Adams, let's see if I get that, on Fleet Street in London. And they are listed uh, as instrument makers for the king. And this would be uh, something that would work on the hand crank. It would rub against the pad and, uh, and a voltage would accumulate on these, on the accumulator in the back. And these were made for, uh, for laboratory demonstrations and uh, I guess to entertain the king. I have some early meters here too. Um, 
This is a, a Lord Kelvin's uh, voltmeter. This goes back to about 1890s into early 1900. And it, it measured large voltages. Um, and it, it did it by the voltage being passed through uh, would go onto these plates. And the, the brass colored ones are fixed and the aluminum colored one is on a uh, pivot. So that as, as you apply to large voltage these plates, um, the static uh, field built up and it would pull the aluminum one towards the uh, brass colored ones in proportion to the amount of electricity. Yeah. It was gravity based, so it was, you zeroed it by adjusting the little balance weights down at the bottom. So that was for voltage. The other thing that Lord Kelvin made was a current meter. And that's this piece right here, um, which basically works by uh, weighing the amount of voltage, the result of the amount of voltage you're putting on. There's, it weighs about 60 pounds and it has these two heavy discs on either side. And as a current, and you can see how heavy a current they were talking about with the, the wires we've got here, we come through these copper pieces and, and the magnetic field they would produce would uh, deflect the plates. And how that deflected the plates would be measured on this, uh, this big scale over here. And um, you could see that it's, they're talking about a serious amount of currents, 50 amps, and then with counterweights, you could have uh, little multipliers too. As we get um, into things that started to become uh, radio and wireless, I have uh, two, I call them Hertzian reflectors. They were used in laboratories to uh, demonstrate Hertzian waves. And it worked uh, by having, uh, you could see the contacts in this reflector. Uh, they'd apply a big voltage through an induct uh, induction coil in the back. And when they'd produce an arc, across the room would be this unit. And that's a coherer. And there'd be little metal filings in there. And as the uh, radio waves from the transmitter would hit that, the filings would cohere, uh, make contact across the two metal elements and there would be a bell or some kind of uh, hookup with the battery in the back to signify that we made a spark and the spark made the bell ring on the other side. Um, this is not really an electronic thing, but it goes back to the 1920s and it's called a revigator. It's This is kind of a Definitely a quack medicine thing. The other guys were serious about things that they were building <clears throat> to do x-rays and electrotherapy. <clears throat> but this was an idea um, when uh, radiation was just starting to come into uh, some, some understanding by scientists. And they figured that <clears throat> the energy of the atom would have to be good for you. So you'd fill this with drinking water and um, they made it out of what I could think must have just been low grade uranium ore. Uh, the outside is glazed with a lead glaze, so nothing comes out. But when I stuck a, a Geiger counter inside, the uh, it went off the, the the needle went off the scale. The um, they came out of popularity in, in the late 20s. Uh, their spokesperson was a famous golfer at the time, and he swore that he would. Uh, this made him feel great, and he was going to drink a gallon of this stuff every day for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, the rest of his life was only two years. Oh. So, um, one more thing I wanted to see in here that I just thought was the neatest thing. We think we have some of the more modern stuff now, but back in the teens, someone came out with the Reverso Toaster. And where some of these early ones, you had to flip it open, take the bread out, flip it around, put it back in again. The reverso with this little clever arrangement would just flip it around and do the other side of your toast. What else could you ask for? Uh, we're gonna venture into another room now. Let me turn an extra light on. 
Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, we have some more early meters in here. Uh, one thing I don't get to show off very often is antique Christmas lights. These are, you find them in catalogs going back to like 1910. And I've spent a lot of time, you know, when you have the virus, what are you gonna do? Uh, finding these at flea markets and, uh, and antique shops, getting enough to put together a set, uh, a couple of sets. And um, by running them on a dimmer, uh, I've had sets together for a good 10 years now, and I've only had one uh, bulb fail. They're running at about 10% of what they could run. Um, the old telescope I got at the uh, flea market too. The guy couldn't date it, didn't know how old it was, but when we took some of the pieces apart, we found a maker's mark on it with the date of 1840. So this uh, is incredibly well-made knurled knobs. How they did this stuff without, uh, without power tools just amazes me. But a quick look at some of the other meters here. Uh, this is an electrodynamometer, which was an early way of another early way of measuring voltage, and it has a fixed single coil and a movable coil. And the downside of these kind of meters was to get a reading. You would read what you were able to get on the scale, but then you would have to come to this chart to uh, translate what your reading was to what it really means in your application. And um, and, this, and the amount of time it would have taken just to make a simple measurement was really incredible. Uh, another interesting thing over here is uh, this piece here, which is a, um, they called it an eye magnet. It would have been used in a doctor's office. And they said it was for patients who, in, in the industrial age, they get the shot of wall in there. They would pull the person up to this, uh, get the point right there to their eye, turn on the current, and it would, uh, in theory, extract the, uh, the metal piece in the same path that it went. But uh, theories are one thing and practice is another. This is an uh, electrostatic uh, current meter that um, what zeroed the needle would have been the string coming down. And... Uh, Kind of like pith balls, the one lead is, is on the base, and there's another lead hanging down with a ball on it. Um, the charge on it would deflect the uh, the one ball away from the other. You'd read that on the number scale what you were getting, and the uh, when you took the current off, the uh, tension on the string would just bring it back to zero again. Um, Two other things here of interest. This is an early AC meter from Westinghouse. Um, they were called gravity meters. This uh, big marble plate would have to be mounted on a wall. There was a plumb bob over there to make sure you had it level. And then as the, um, um, to zero the needle, you had a counter adjust. You'd close it back up so that you uh, wouldn't get any air currents. And then your, your current to be measured would go through the copper coil and it would put the meter down here. And this is a um, Edison power station meter. So to, to regulate their, their power stations for high and low, they would basically have this uh, meter they could move back and forth to, to balance out the lights to... Uh, reduce or, or increase the load, power going to the load. Uh, these are some early <clears throat> potentiometers. Where are you going, Mike? Man. If you uh, turn a crank, this is a Max Cole. It was a really famous company in Germany that um, you could see the it's filled with, with a resistance wire. If there's snow and, on a window on that side, leave it alone because it's not inspected right now. It's not legal. It's not legal? No. Down and change I'm the, not uh, taking it. Again. The more 
and so the cap version. Um, version four. Here, but if he says, let me see. Yeah. Hey, Ray Soraki, please mute your mic. Okay. And this is just a, uh, another rheostat. And it's just a big, I think it's more of a graphite disc because it'll uh, leave a mark on your fingers like a, a lead pencil would. And the contacts go down. And this was from one of the medical companies. So this wasn't a lab piece. This was for everyday use. And I had never seen until this one a vertical variable condenser. This worked by sliding these plates in and out. This is a two section one. So you would pull on the handle to adjust the condenser. And um, this one, if you can see the note, it's a uh, double plate condenser. And it was salvaged from the E laboratory at uh, Columbia University. This, so this would have been in 1943, this was taken from uh, Howard Armstrong's laboratory. Uh, there's no documentation that said it was his or that it was one that he used, but uh, if he needed a, a double sliding condenser in, in his lab, this would have been it. I have a, um, when I bring people through for demonstrations of radio stuff, um, I start with um, showing some telegraph things, um, basically a key and a, a sounder, and um, and getting them to identify some of these things because I, I show them these as one of the reasons people like Marconi work so hard to make radio. And these are pieces of telegraph wire. This is the kind that uh, ran across the United States outside. And this is a souvenir section of the first transatlantic uh, telegraph cable. And the wire, like once you, you understand the infrastructure of what they had to go through uh, to wire the country and wire under the ocean, you can see why if, if someone could come up with wireless, they'd not only be able to communicate with ships, but they'd be able to provide the service to people without <clears throat> paying for all the wire. And instead of them sending a telegram, what they wanted you to do was send a Marconi gram. Um, some of the costs to, uh, when the first transatlantic cable, it was, you know, even in 1860s dollars, uh, it was dollars per word payable in gold. So uh, the motivation to, uh, to eventually come up with a way to do that wireless was pretty strong. And some of the first ways to receive, this is another one of those coheres, um, like we talked about in the reflector. So when this would be hooked to an antenna and very early equipment, the signal um, would come in, the circuit would close, there'd be an external battery that would run this little tapper to clear the, uh, the filings for the next signal. Uh, so you can imagine that words per minute doing it this way would have been uh, really mean. That's the, the next development would have been uh, crystal detectors and one over here. When um, what radio from Marconi did come into greater use, one of the first places was ships. And um, if you look at any um, movies or documentaries on, uh, on the Titanic, um, these three pieces are the same models of uh, radio equipment that were on the Titanic. This is the uh, detector on the top. It's called a, a Maggie, a magnetic detector, a multiple tuner. And this model coil was the uh, backup transmitter for when the power failed from the, uh, the main transmitter. Um, we know this was uh, documented, even there are no pictures that exist of the uh, the radio room on the Titanic, but uh, the sister ships all had the exact same equipment. These are all on it. The, um, so you start out with the uh, line from the antenna coming to this multiple tuner. This was the first uh, commercial device that actually used uh, rotary condensers. And um, that's these three mounted vertically on the top here. Unfortunately, at that time period, they, um, 
Um, they didn't have air between the uh, plates and the condenser. They had rubber, and the rubber is swollen over over time, so they don't uh, they don't really rotate anymore. If you, if you force it, you'd probably break something there. the The magnetic detector was actually a very sensitive one. It was kept in use into the 1920s. Take your car. With this motorized wire, I'm trying not to do this without cutting everybody off. And the wire would be on a phonograph spring motor, and it turns through these magnets and these coils. You can see the um, <clears throat> the E for Earth grounding it, T for two telephone uh, terminal wires, and uh, A for the antenna. So how this works is still kind of a mystery to me, even though I've, I've read about it and looked it up. I worked on magnetic hysteresis. Mike, it's and not I, when you go in reverse. What's that? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, and it, the second magnet would, uh, it would be erased for the, uh, the next trip around. And then, um, the uh, induction coil down here would just be when the uh, power failed for the main uh, transmitter. The uh, this one would be uh, put into place under batteries and uh, present the that uh, or the spark rather that uh, is uh, tied to the antenna. Um, when uh, they got a little more developed and. and uh, World War One came along. There were a lot of advances. Um, this radio is the Marconi 101, and it's the, um, the first receiver they actually built in the United States. This one was built in 1914. Let's see if I can get in, yeah. and um, was built here in New Jersey, and uh, served uh, through World War One and, and later years on the USS Virginia. The, um, the the radio operator must have been very proud of it. He's carved his initials that are in the back. It's a basically a very giant crystal radio. To have a clean presentation, he drilled through so the wires wouldn't uh, be going across his desk. But it had um, two separate crystal detectors and um, tuning condenser that's more the traditional kind that you would expect. And then uh, a coupling coil that moves in and out based on uh, turning this dial in the front. So uh, except for connections, there's probably no reason this couldn't work. It, uh, it tuned through long wave uh, based on the um, transformer taps that you selected, uh, almost uh, partially into the, uh, the current broadcast, AM broadcast band. So that was like a state-of-the-art uh, 1914 receiver. And this was a, um, a transmitter, a spark transmitter from around the same World War I vintage. Um, this was used by the Navy uh, to, to communicate with ships on the Great Lakes. And it was taken uh, out of service, and I have... It ran with the motor generator that I have in the garage. It's just huge. And um, the sparks in these actually came between all these plates. The high voltage would come in. And when it was keyed, the, um, the idea for all the plates was to have multiple sparks so that you had a more audible tone that, that was easier to read uh, by the receiving stations. And you could see the big Western meters and fine tuning knob and uh, throw switches to, to disconnect the uh, antenna or whatever during a storm. Uh, this is another transmitter. This was built more for amateur radio by the Clap Easton company. This would be a, a spark transmitter again. And um, inside it has a big uh, transformer and then uh, filled with glass plate condensers. And um, 
the motor is to uh, to turn what they call the rotary spark gap. And that was another thing to get multiple contacts as the uh, as the motor rotated the, the contacts. The spark there'd be many sparks per second as a instead of just one. You could start to almost generate a tone. And then finally, the output that from that just went into this antenna coil, and you would tune it by moving the, the tap to a different location. When this, this came from an auction uh, radio club in uh, North Carolina, and uh, when it got here, two of us carried it in, and uh, based on the weight, it landed on this bench, and it's been there for almost 10 years now. Um, another thing from around the same period, yeah, maybe early 20s, is, um, is this a Western Electric Amplifier. And the, uh, the call sign over there is because this was the kind of amplifier that was actually used in the movie The Babe, uh, Babe Ruth's uh, baseball career. And you could see the announcers for the game are um, speaking to a microphone that goes into an amplifier like this then into the phone lines to the uh, radio station. Um, so Western Electric built some pretty sophisticated stuff, um, two single stage audios and a push-pull circuit. Um, and then what was kind of unusual, they call it uh, increase output, but it's basically a, a gain control, which uh, you didn't see usually on very old stuff. Uh, I think maybe Dave uh, Abrams used this with the Phillies in his earlier days. No comment. This is a um, <clears throat> the Cooley radio ray photo kit. Uh, I did a report on this at one time. Um, before television, their idea was to send radio pictures to your home. And they were going to do that in a very different way than you'd think of television. When the um, program would be going on at the uh, transmitter side, they would take a picture, develop the picture, put it through a scanner, and then you would be told to... Uh, for the next minute, you're going to be not hearing the fight anymore. You'd be hearing buzzes and squeaks. And on the receiving side, you would um, receive the image onto a roller that it, that would, uh, with a little electric needle, print on the on the paper, and you'd develop that. And sure enough, you'd have a picture of the radio program you were looking at. It did actually get use, um, and it was there were regularly scheduled programs on uh, a number of uh, stations for a short time. This is a um, a picture of how good a, an image you could get, and the, the, this page shows things you can correct when you're not getting that good an image. Um, I think it's life. Um, really in the market was uh, measured more in months than uh, anything else. Um, another little x-ray setup. This, um, this one goes to about 1913. Also, uh, it's a Campbell company out of uh, Boston. And what this would do is more like a fluoroscope. So you, you would generate your high voltage here, you would power the uh, x-ray tube, and then the doctor would uh, have you stand at the x-ray tube and then he'd look through at a <clears throat> uh, fluorescent screen and stand on the other side of you. And basically, if you thought, uh, you know, your hand was fractured, they'd have you hold it there and, uh, and look through the, uh, the viewer to see if they can find a uh, fracture or not. Uh, this is unusual too. I actually got from Bob Dobush. Um, it's nothing to do with early television. It's a Westinghouse demonstrator tube. And uh, as you would um, put on a different plate or uh, grid voltages, um, I guess they have phosphors on the uh, plate. And you could demonstrate to uh, students that the, uh, as you change different voltages, the, uh, the colors change going up the screen. Um, this is an Edison motor, 
with a fan blade on it, uh, probably from the 1890s. Um, and you can see that even 120, 30 years ago, if you did something, built something right, bearings are still very good in it. The, um, it still works. Um, the interesting thing about this is the battery with it. Um, although I wouldn't use it now. The speed was controlled by raising and lowering the plates out of the acid. Um, and depending on how much uh, current you wanted, a little bit in the acid was enough or, or a lot. The um, couple of other things that I want to show up here. These are some, I have a collection of Geissler tubes. These um, were used in laboratories um, for study, but also made for um, entertainment purposes and demonstration. Um, a high voltage uh, would run these lights. Oops. And um, it's actually very colorful. I don't think it's coming across that way on the uh, on the screen here. But the, um, the studying they were doing on Geissler tubes and uh, Crookes tubes was, was serious work in physics departments and uh, scientists. These three represent like a little bit of an evolution. And this Crookes tube just has um, phosphorescent rocks in it. And when you would apply a voltage to the top, the, uh, the tubes would light up. Then they learn the rocks would light up. When they, they learned that if they made a paste out of those phosphors and put it on the face, they could make the face light up and experimented with putting things like uh, uh, objects in the way this is a little cross in the way that would make a, uh, um, it would be blocked so you'd have a pattern of a cross on the screen. This has the same idea with the cross, but they've already, um, evolved to a, an electron gun of some form and um, and then still put charges on the uh, on the cross and the, uh, the last element in the gun in these connections and and when you look at some of the work that uh, uh, Rossing did with uh, with Swarkin in, in uh, Russia before he came over here uh, this was their start this kind of idea was their start on cathode gray tubes. Uh, let's see, another unrelated to a television item I have is an original um, theremin. This is a picture of an artist playing a theremin. These came uh, into, into vogue, as you would say, in um, in the 1920s, late 20s. Let's see if I get far enough away. And it worked with volume control being how you moved with this one. And then the pitch with that one. And um, I've never been able to make much of a coherent sound out of it. But someone was able to do the Star Trek theme on it. Uh, probably a modern theremin. The story goes, uh, there's a whole history of uh, the theremin being kidnapped by the Russians and eventually released. But the, <clears throat> the peak of interest in theremins as a musical instrument came when um, there was gonna be a, a concert in Carnegie Hall with uh, 27 people playing uh, musical pieces on with the theremins. And the problem with the theremin is depending on the day, the uh, humidity, the temperature, some days they worked great, some days they worked lousy. And when the big day came, uh, it was a lousy day. And um, they all sounded like, uh, like crap. <laughs> so the, uh, the fad of the theremins uh, faded out. We're gonna take um, a look at a couple of older radios in here now. Um, oops. These are early DeForest units that used the first three element uh, triodes uh, that he called audions. 
when uh, they weren't really full radios, they were more audio and control boxes. And it was up to the uh, ham radio operator to figure out uh, a connection. But you had basically something to raise and lower the filament voltage, connections going in and out. And uh, that's uh, this one is a little closer to being a radio that uh, actually has a tuner section. And then you have to uh, use this as the detector. And then in New, right here in New Jersey, 1916, uh, Adams Morgan Company built this uh, radio called the Paragon, which is starting to resemble the three dial sets that, uh, that became popular in the 20s. Uh, multiple taps on it, variometers, and uh, a little bit later in 1918, after the war, uh, came this set by the uh, Chicago Radio Laboratories. And Chicago Radio Laboratory, as time went on, uh, their, their, one of their models was the Zenith. And the, uh, the name stuck better than Chicago Radio Laboratories. And eventually, they changed the company name to, uh, to Zenith. These are a couple of early cone speakers. Uh, made by DeForest, and those are early horn speakers up there. Let's go around. Horn speakers came first. The simplest ones um, in the early 1920s were just uh, units that you would attach your headphones to. And uh, it, it just amplified uh, by uh, an expanding volume of air. But then uh, cone speakers came along and there wasn't really any, any rules as to even which way the cone faced or whether it would have a decorative front. They all sounded uh, you know, equally weak, but they did sound better than many of the horn speakers. So these are also cone speakers. And then around here, a couple more that are pretty scarce. The, uh, there's only a few of the oriental lady speakers around. So well, one other thing to point out, uh, this you know, there's cable TV, but there's also there efforts uh, with this called an audio voice. I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, where they were trying to provide a, a home service through telephone lines. Um, so you would have instead of cable TV, you'd have cable music. But um, for whatever reasons, it never caught on. I can't find much information about or any really about that company. So we're going to take a, a trip downstairs next. Bear with me a second. So now we're entering radio in the 1920s. Uh, one of the first ones I want to point out is the uh, one of the first super hits that was made for sale to the public. Actually, it's theoretically provided as a kit because the Lutz company didn't have a, a license. Uh, RCA was not giving out licenses. But the idea that it was uh, something theoretically put together by the owner, um, they, they felt they were safe from being chased by, uh, by RCA. But these two, two units compo composite, com combined to make one very big radio. Um, it was set up for a long wave or short wave. You had to make selections, uh, different tap settings, and uh, different dials for uh, the oscillator on, if you're on the uh, A band or the B band. And then this section would have had the controls for uh, filament voltage for all the 
IF circuits uh, and then the audio circuits to the speaker. Um, these are Atwater Kent breadboards. Uh, Atwater Kent started as a uh, company that was going to help <clears throat> provide a good radio at a good price when uh, a lot of these others are selling at a high price. And one of his ways to do it was to mass produce uh, uh, things with Bakelite and to leave you on your own for a cabinet. <clears throat> Crosley Company, on the other hand, included a cabinet, but he just made a very cheap radio. Um, they used things like um, book condensers instead of plates and uh, and basically he considered himself the Henry Ford of radio. These are all the different variations that uh, we went through over the years. This is a um, Hollis Baird um, drum uh, receiver. The uh, Hollis Baird company was up in, in Boston and uh, they made this set probably 1930-ish and it had it, and I have the receiver that went with it. The idea of the drum, uh, you can see where the neon tube would, would go in back here, was that um, you would get rid of the keystoning effect since it's not a disc uh, and your, your pattern isn't kind of V-shaped. But, uh, but you can have a squared off image. You can see the square hole in there. Unfortunately, this uh, particular one has uh, almost all the wiring dry rotted. So uh, on my, uh, one of my bucket lists is uh, figuring out the, to rewire this sometime. Uh, this is a Crosley. The, um, the idea of this that Crosley came up with, um, he was a big proponent in helping out the rural farmer. And the rural farmer would have access to a newspaper or his mail unless they went into town. So his idea was you would have this device as a printer hooked to your radio. And at about two in the morning, the timer would go off and it would uh, print out the transmission that was sent by the Crosley station and eventually uh, WOR in New York, you could see the wall sign out. This was a copy that I got from uh, files from WOR and you can see the results of static so that you'd be getting your image just fine. And then some static would come along and there'd just be this smeary trail of paper being spit out. So that's the cost of paper. Um, the image quality that you can get was never much better than that. So any images you wanted of what was going on in the news were basically um, like line drawings, not really photographs. But they had high hopes. These are some of the uh, sales literature from the, uh, from the device. $79.50, you're ready to go. <clears throat> uh, this one, the Lincoln's, the radio visor. Uh, I also came across at a flea market, the, uh, if you want to just buy the Jenkins lens, they sold all these parts separately. So there was the uh, big lens, right, still in the factory box. This radio goes back to, um, you know, uh, World War I kind of time. And uh, what's interesting about it is it's listed as a radio compass receiver. And if you look at the switch here, uh, this, this would have been used on dirigibles, is my understanding. Uh, the transfer switch from antenna to compass. So it would be a receiver. But if you had a directional antenna, uh, this was the compass to track one of the Navy stations to... Uh, to guide you back uh, as you're coming over the ocean. This one theoretically too has some uh, uh, were made to, to be anti-static, low up your dirigible. 
earliest stuff is a uh, long wave where uh, the broadcast band, uh, you know, might have some things that are in the uh, 200 meter, 400 meter range. Uh, a lot of the early long wave stuff was 30,000 meters. And, uh, and then you had big tuning coils. This is when you moved in and out from uh, the lower coil and picked all the different taps. So this would, would probably go back to the, uh, the mid-teens. It was made in uh, Pottstown, uh, Pennsylvania by the Rio Apparatus Company. Uh, Pottstown, now famous for their Yingling beer. This might be one of the longest radios here. I got this just at the Kutztown meet this uh, end of the summer. It's again from the Lutz Company, and it measures uh, just under six feet long. And it's a super heterodyne with a uh, pre-selector for the antenna, RF amplifiers, then um, the oscillator section, and IF amplifiers, and then finally audio. The, um, the battle they were doing then was um, based on the problem of the low gain in the, in the tubes. If you only have a gain of eight or 10, uh, the more stages, the better. And if you can um, work them at their best efficiency uh, by getting an IF frequency instead of varied frequencies, uh, you can get your best results. And um, and that was the uh, the hottest thing you could have bought back then, and certainly impressed your neighbors. This is what an early um, 1920s transmitter set would have looked like. Um, when stations popped up in the 20s, they were often just on the uh, on the top of a uh, department store. They could have been at a uh, church because uh, they would broadcast sermons. And, uh, and very small operations, some of them growing into the uh, stations that still exist. These, uh, this is the power supply section. And these tubes, I believe, uh, are, uh, the rating was for about five watts each. So this would only have been about a 20 watt uh, transmitter, but if it's the only game in town and with a decent antenna on the, on the building, uh, it could be enough for a department store to sell a few more radios to the uh, to the neighbors. Unrelated to radio or television, this is an Altair 8800. And um, anyone who's looked at computers, uh, work with this partner and program these things. And the uh, grand rest was history. These, um, these, um, this is a Norton Hauk, which is also designed by this man, Lutz. And it's from the early days of um, the idea of shielding each section of you to reduce so they had a metal shield between each stage, um, <clears throat> a cover for the tube to, sh to shield it from the coil, and the coils are shielded from the other compartments. <coughs> Where <clears throat> some average radios, you know, would only have gains in the hundreds <clears throat> or thousands anyway, the, uh, they made claims on some of these to get gains in the millions. <clears throat> this is an early, AC set in Argus. Um, some of the things to note on it are um, that it had a ballast tube that was more like a light bulb that <clears throat> matched it to the line, free, line voltage coming in. And the condensers for filters were basically slop jars of chemicals in, in jars and then the, uh, the leads coming up and you can see the corrosion that's uh, built up on them over the years. Um, these are number 199 tubes and some 01 tubes. Hey, Dave. <clears throat> These are um, early, uh, another early Marconi set um, made for uh, communications receiving. And um, 
and then they came up with a later version where they, they modified it some. And you can see the, the range 3,500 meters. So that's uh, it's getting in a pretty long way of stuff. Hey, uh, Mike, Mike, this is Dave. Um, yep. I'm getting an error message that you're on very low bandwidth where you are right now. We're only seeing like one picture every 10 or 15 seconds. Um, I, th I guess you're in, at a range of the Wi-Fi. Um, might be yeah. a good idea to just show a few more things here and go back upstairs. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me give a couple quick things that I wanted to catch. Um, there's a lot of rooms down here. Is it any better or worse over here? It's a little better. It's like a fast slideshow now. Well, this is a place where, you know, you could come down at the end of a hard day's work and just say, you know, I think I need to sit in front of the brainwave synchronizer for a bit. This maybe you can get the alpha, beta, and, and delta range sit yourself in front of that strobe light and 20, 30 minutes later, you don't care about much of what's going on anymore. Anyway, we're going to go upstairs now and uh, look at some of the TVs. Is that any better now that I'm upstairs? Um, seems like it. Let's see how it goes. Okay. So, one of the first um, TVs we'll look at is the um, the Dumont 183. When I got this, um, this was from Dave Johnston's collection, and um, it worked, but the CRT was uh, having a near death experience. So you really had to have room lights out to see anything on it. And um, one day I was uh, cruising along on eBay. And on Mondays uh, is when our old friend Harry Poster used to always have an ad. And he had this ad from, it basically said it was glassware from a retired Dumont engineer. And he had a picture of things that were everything from little helium neon lasers this guy must have experimented with on his own to um, a CRT and a partial CRT. And one of them looked like the CRT for this, but Harry said there was nothing on it, uh, no information. But I got a bit in and one, took the time to uh, install it in here. And sure enough, <clears throat> for a little over a hundred bucks, I got just the, uh, the CRT I need. This is gonna come on pretty loud. The, um, I'm having trouble with the volume control. Leave you totally recharged. Miss Holidays even buy a 50 minute massage session and get a second session free. Massage and Keep your body working. Anyway, certainly uh, plenty of volume and, and plenty of brightness. So I really lucked into something. Here's my, my help while I was. Uh, let's see what we can do. Um, this is the uh, the Philco. Um, Carol spoke about this briefly last month. Um, came from Chuck Gasolina's collection. Uh, and... Um, it has one of those CRTs that's six inches compared to the GE, which is uh, usually five inches, and um, and just gets a really nice bright image compared to anything with a five BP four. Let's see what we get here. And although it's listed in the uh, <clears throat> on the ETF website, and and Daryl mentioned it, it, does have sound. 
So I don't know where the, the mix up came on. That. But it's a, um, a set that had, <clears throat> as Chuck explained it to me, uh, was it Phil Go in there? engineering department would keep tinkering with it over time they put a, a newer tuner in it and uh, added the audio and uh and it's a special built from i could tell uh, crt in it hey mike it's chuck yep yeah, yeah that uh has the audio in it because it's really um not the original it's the original cabinet that was in 1938 but when I talked to the engineer that I bought it from 45 years ago, um, he had told me that they, again, like you said, they use that set in the, uh, in the shop to change and test different items on it. And that's when they, uh, they added the audio to it uh, somewhere in the early 40s. Okay. And it's about the same time, a couple of years later, they added the, uh, the rotary tuner, took the push buttons out. Right, that's that's a nice shiny one. <laughs> so it looks a little out of place next to the other stuff. And then you get to what uh, looks like a traditional Philco knob too. Well, that's yeah, it was. It was like I said, it was uh, the the tuner that's in there is from the 1948 sets. They were designing that 48 um, tuner, um, and it supposedly was being delivered, supposed to be released with the 47 sets that never happened. Right. And uh, he had taken the thing home 10 or 20 years earlier and uh, just left it in his house. That's why it actually looks as good as it does. Right. But it's uh, compared to the other sets, it's the best working one, too. The TT5 and the, and the G just don't have the same picture. Uh, unfortunately, AP4 in it. What's that? The tube is a 6AP4. And was that used in anything else? Nope, not a thing. It was a custom built for Philco custom built it. Okay. Yeah, I knew um, it's not one that I want to have burn out on me. So. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't believe what I did to that 45 years ago to get it to work. Really? <laughs> yeah, don't ever look under the uh, canvas bag. Okay, fair enough. The um, This is the... Um, RCA Model 5. Um, I haven't had this on in a while. The, uh, the color screen uh, control burned out, and uh, that's on a, a dual control that I haven't been able to find a replacement for, so I kind of tacked in a, uh, a poor substitute. And the, uh, the Zenith, I don't know if <clears throat> many know the history of this, um, but it's it's one of only a few that still exist. And apparently they were only made as demonstrators by Zenith and, uh, and never were on public sale. They were put in their uh, sales um, distribution centers to, uh, to show people they can do it, but uh, they don't think it was ready for prime time. The um, interesting thing I found was, uh, I think it was in one of their uh, corporation uh, annual reports uh, they're top of the line, I think a 21-inch uh, TV, uh, black and white, was in the exact same cabinet, just with the uh, the different bezel in here. Everything else on it looked exactly the same as this. Um, this is one of the um, G models that uh, Daryl showed us last week, and it has that same, uh, I guess you said Phillips tube. And also another uh, one with a nice bright image. And this does have some degree of a uh, phosphor burn on it. When the, uh, the set is off, maybe you can see a little trace of it. It's like a donut right about in the center. And, um, but when you're watching a program, it, it really doesn't seem to interfere with anything. Um, I also have the, uh, the RR359 with a 12 inch tube and, and uh, unfortunately no Russian writing anywhere on it that I can see. 
but I, I guess it does have the version that Daryl was talking about where the other controls would have been on the other sides of this uh, plate. And I have one of the uh, invitations to uh, the RCA exhibit building for the New York World's Fair in 1939. Uh, this is the Andrea. And <clears throat> similar to the um, Empire State at the uh, museum is the Model 41, which is the tabletop version. Um, Steve mentioned last week about the uh, glass lenses being in all the holes on the disc. And when you look at this, you can see that it's the um, 45 line triple interlaced. So they're all staggered to do um, the top first one would be line one, then two and then three, and then the next one would be four and so on uh, down the line. And that's the little crater tube that would uh, be wide enough to then <clears throat> project the image from this onto the frosted screen. So uh, compared to the other mechanical sets, you're, you're at least watching this on a screen up uh, uh, through a porthole. And the uh, where the Empire State has both the sound a radio for the sound and for the picture, this only has the uh, setup for the picture. When I got this, I also got this um, invitation <clears throat> to the uh, 1933 World's Fair. Century of Progress by the Hudson Motor Company, where you can go and become televised on October, so it's October 25th, 33. And there's a color tell wheel here up to a Philco and the uh, Western Visionette. This is the um, the 12cc, two is it, I guess. And um, this and, um, and some other things that I got, uh, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of help from really generous uh, television collectors over the years. And one of the guys that I guess on this before me was Ed Ritan. And I'd just like to throw in that uh, he was the best guy to uh, share information with you, to uh, be enthusiastic for anything that I was doing, to... Uh, uh, offer his support to uh, guide me into things that I was thinking of buying, why they were important. Um, he just he just knew it all, and I, I've missed him a lot. The other um, field sequential set that we can run today is the uh, slave set, uh, which let's see, I'm gonna have to get set up a little bit here. Those those only play the Wizard of Oz, right? That's it. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it to agree with me today, though. You know, yesterday I had a picture and I had some brightness control issues, but it did light up. Well, you know, in any case, it's a real He-Man TV that sounds like it's revving up for takeoff, you know? Yeah. Huh. She's got stage fright, all of us watching. Tell you what, I think, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Let's try this. The perils of live TV. There we go. There she goes.
The only problem I sometimes have with Daryl's uh, converter is forgetting to turn it on. You'll notice that the convergence is perfect. <laughs> Took me hours. Let's uh, jump ahead a little bit. It looks a lot better than you'd think. That's great. We had to have a Comcast uh, service guy in here. And uh, when I was telling him about this, he thought I must have been kidding him. And I finally had to prove it to him. So he had something to go back and tell his buddies about. Does everybody know how it ends? Yeah, the, yeah, the ship sinks, right? That's it. So anyway, that was the last stop on the tours. If, if we're having trouble down the basement, I'm sorry about that. Well, that was a hell of a tour, Mike. My voice almost made it all the way. I'm really losing it. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was great. Fun. Mike, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you very I, much, uh, Mike. Yes, thank you. That was amazing. You have a collection that I can only dream of. That's <laughs> right. Um, Mike, well, when can you uh, adopt me so I can be in your will? And uh... <laughs> You know, I was actually thinking of um, you know, this time of year, all these... Um, Public TV stations and all are saying things about uh, when you do your estate planning to think of us. Well, all these things would like to have a much nicer place to live and spread out a little more. Mm. So if you guys are doing estate planning, think about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, um, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, Dave, Dave, when is our next? Um, what is our next uh, date? Uh, well, we're going to be on the um, the third Saturday of every month. We said we were going to do this. Right. Um, I don't uh, have a calendar in front of me right now. Blake, do you remember what the date was? I believe the 16th. 16th of January, third, uh, third Saturday of January. That's third correct. Saturday is correct. Okay. Well, um, Watch for information about it. Um, Blake is going to be uh, making a presentation of his um, Predictor collection. Um, and we will have um, it's probably about the same format as, uh, as this time. So I want to thank everybody. It looks to me like between our Zoom and our um, YouTube participants, we had over 100 tonight, wow. um, which is awfully good. And I hope this keeps, to, keeps growing. So thank you all for participating, Mike. Thanks again for a wonderful tour. And um, we will see you all next time.